Hello folks, I'm Patricia and I'd like to welcome you to the Haiku P podcast, Series 5, Episode 15, the one where we're joined by Joshua Gage, who's going to help us understand how to write haiku with a little bit of depth. I've been looking forward to chatting with Joshua about this, as I look forward to all my chats and workshops on the podcast. There's so much to learn. How can I add strength and depth to my haiku? Well, listen on and we'll find out. But before we drill into this subject, there's a couple of reminders for you. At the moment, we have a reading period until the 15th of August for haiku and scenery using contrast in your juxtaposition. My terrific, hardworking team are waiting for your submissions. Don't let us down. Linda Ludwig, who reads all your YouTube prompt submissions, is awaiting your haiku and senryu for a chance to be featured in a podcast and, of course, in the Poetry P Journal. All you have to do is add your work to the comments in YouTube for the video prompt. And please, can you give us your original work? Hopefully, you're signed up to the mailing for Poetry P, and you'll know I'm a little bit behind with everything this month. August's podcasts will be out a tad late, and replies to your Highborn submissions should all be done by the end of August now. So if you haven't heard by then, don't be afraid to chase me up for an answer. So shall we hear from Joshua Gage, co-editor of Otorushi Journal, which takes Horaku, Horror Tanker and Horror Haibun. I know some of you really enjoyed our speculative poetry topic, and perhaps you have something for Joshua and his co-editor, Lithica. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by Joshua Gage. Joshua, shall we hear what you've got to say on the topic of vertical and horizontal axes? To understand a, a horizontal and vertical axis, one really has to understand Japanese history. In the Muromachi period of Japanese history, Ashikaga Takauji uh, obtained some strong samurai support and deposed Emperor Go Daigo, who had alienated the samurai in the Kenmu Restoration. In 1338, Takauji was proclaimed shogun and established his government in Kyoto. The ensuing period of Ashikaga rule, 1336 to 1573, so this is going to predate what we know of as Hoku and Haiku and all that, was called the Muromachi from the district of Kyoto in which the headquarters, the Hana no Gosho or Flower Palace, were located by the third shogun, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu. Uh, in 1378, Yotsu Mitsu allowed constables to become strong regional rulers, later called daimyos. Uh, a new national culture called the Muromachi culture uh, emerged uh, from the shogunate headquarters to reach all levels of society. And this is what I think Shirane is tapping into when he's talking about the horizontal and the vertical axis. This culture was strongly influenced in Zen Buddhism, as well as re renewed trade and cultural exchange with China. The proximity of the imperial court to the shogunate and resulted in a commingling of imperial family members, courtiers, daimyo, samurai, and Zen priests. The wealth of the daimyo created economic growth and the arts began to flourish. Poetry, literature, no drama, the tea ceremony, flower arranging were all expanded or invented during the Muromachi times. So all of the things that we think of um, in association with haiku or, or some of the other Japanese arts that are, are akin to haiku, all of this goes back to this period. However, the daimyos would continue to struggle until 1600 when Tokugawa Ieyasu wins the Battle of Sekigahara, ushering in a new era. This is the Tokugawa or Edo period, and this is really where things start ramping up for what we know of as hoku and haiku and other, and other Japanese literary arts. 
During the first century of the Tokugawa rule, Jap Japan's population doubled to 30 million. The shogunate constructed roads, eliminated tolls, uh, standardized coinage. This created uh, a stability in the country and encouraged urban growth. Private schools greatly expanded, particularly those attached to temples and shrines and raised literacy in the country to 30%. The advent of printing uh, increased production and consumption of literature by the general population. The excess wealth, wealth among the merchant class, particularly in major, major cities like Edo, Osaka, and Kyoto, led to ukiyo, or the floating world, where affluent members of society would seek pleasure or escape in brothels, tea houses, theaters, in, in the, the red light districts of these major cities. Uh, we also have to learn a little bit about the history of Kabuki theater to understand uh, the horizontal and vertical access. Kabuki theater uh, began in 1603 when Izumo no Okuni began performing with a troupe of female dancers, a new style of dance drama. Uh, female performers played for both men and women in comic playlets about ordinary life. This had mass appeal, and Okuni was asked to perform before the imperial court. Rival troops quickly formed, and Kabuki was born as an ensemble dance and drama performed primarily by women. The widespread appeal of Kabuki in red light districts often meant that a diverse crowd of different social classes gathered. To appeal to these various social classes, Kabuki employed a dual plot system. And this taps into the horizontal and vertical axis. Sikai, world or sphere, is your vertical plot. Uh, conjuring or alluding to a historical ideal, whereas the shuko or intention, which is the horizontal plot, uh, appeals to the current lifestyle and events of modern time. Uh, Haruo Shirani, in his book Traces of Dreams, argues that Basho tapped into these two axes when writing Hoku and Haikai no Renga. Uh, and that's that's primarily where this comes from is Shirani's Traces of Dreams. So one way to think about this is to see the, the Sikai, which is the vertical axis, as the frame and the Shuko as the individual plot. For example, playwright Surura Namboku IV uh, wrote The Ghosts of Yotsuya using the uh, Sikai of the Chushingura, which is the 47 Ronin plot. It's been made into movies. It's uh, kabuki theater. Like all of these things, it's, it's a very common, classic, well-known plot. It's something that is alluded to in classical haiku. However, adopted for the Shuko or the horizontal plot, was the story of one of the retainers who committed robbery and murder for selfish desires. Actual topics of the contemporary time, a woman of a ghost appearing, uh, an incident of dead bodies of a man and woman washing up on the shore were, are incorporated into the plot, but the basic Chushingura tale would have been familiar with the audiences. So we have this overriding umbrella tale, which is your vertical, and then within that are these uh, contemporary plots. That's your horizontal. Uh, they were the the audience would have been familiar with the forty seven Ronin tale and would have been there to see the spectacle and and how it was adapted. So we move forward to Basho. Basho was born in sixteen forty four to a farming family with distant ties to the samurai class. He serves as a domestic in the Toto household where he learns the Teoman style of Haikai. When he's 28, he moves to Edo and sets himself up as a master. One of his achievements uh, is to fuse the recluse poetry tradition, uh, which comes from Tang Dynasty China poets, Japanese wandering poets like Saigyo, uh, and so on, with Haikai. Uh, this is the vertical axis, the tradition of the wandering poet or the wandering or recluse poet uh, within the horizontal, which is gonna be your high kai tradition. An example of this also is uh, Basho's haibun. 
Basho and Haibun were contemporary and that he meets, he meets new poets, he exchanges ideas, he composes linked verse together with these poets. But they were also part of the historical past. Shirani argues that the classic on, Oku no Hosomichi is contemporary and that Basho is traveling and writing with Sora, but it's also a trip to see famous places connected with famous poets like Saigyo. So he is tapping into the past. He is engaging with the contemporary and the modern, and this creates the two axes uh, that Shirani is discussing. Shirani argues that Basho's haiku philosophy revolves around this idea. Any haiku written only in the present would be too fleeting. Uh, anything written only for the past would be too out of date or out of touch with the immediate, which is, again, something that, that Basho really wanted to tap into. Haiku, therefore, depend upon the past, but must be grounded in the present. Shirani also argues for a haikai imagination, which is encapsulated by ideas of social incongruity, recontextualization, and a communal approach to cultural and art across rank and status. So again, a lot of this goes back to the things that were being attempted in um, Kabuki theater. And then, of course, that cross-mingling from the Edo period or the Edo mentality um, that, that was occurring at this time. Uh, we're going to move to English now in English language haiku. So with that in mind... If we are to write English language haiku along both the horizontal and the vertical axis, we must consider what texts we can recontextualize and update. In other words, Western poets must consider various Western canons from which to infuse their haiku with vertical richness and depth. I would argue that the first thing for authors to consider is literary illusions. What are the cultural literatures of your audience and how can you tap into images from them also consider cultural history both real and mythic you may also want to consider various cultural associations including references to pop culture another source and one which basho himself used are cultural conflicts such as war and social conflicts and so if Basho can use these and Kaikaku and some of his other disciples can use these, certainly English language poets can use these as well. Now cometh the writing prompts. Let us drink and say huzzah. Huzzah. The first prompt is a focused ekphrastic prompt, but I think it, one easy and obvious focus is a national uh, and international works of art and literature. Write a poem that alludes to in some way Write a haiku or send you that that alludes to in some way a national work or an internationally recognized work of art or literature. In the UK, for example, we have the Booker. In the States, there's the Pulitzer. Look at one of those novels and write a haiku about one of the characters or tapping into one of those characters, tapping into some of the imagery fam that are famous in some of those books. In the same way, Write a poem alluding to a famous work of art. Write a piece subverting the Mona Lisa or black lighting Van Gogh's Starry Night. Doodle glasses on the Sistine Chapel and re-rig the bells of Notre Dame to play ACDC at midnight, but do it in haiku. A second prompt is to pick haiku related to the history or myth of your culture or cultures. I would focus upon iconic and in symbolic or images or iconic plants and animals to your culture and use them as possible kigo. You can also think about myth and folklore here. The third prompt is something that does, uh, Basho's disciples, particularly Kaikaku, tapped into a lot. Write a haiku based upon popular culture or a similar cultural association. This can be something classic or iconic, like a famous photograph or a, a movie, or something more modern, like a top 40 single or a recent national headline. The idea is that a national understanding of, of, of the event 
one that crosses his social status or education would add resonance and depth to the haiku. This would tap into that vertical axis. The last prop is to consider various cultural conflicts, uh, be they national or international conflicts, or social and cultural conflicts against the historical foundations of your culture. Either way, tap into the images from those conflicts and inspire and infuse your haiku. So again, looking at the headlines, looking at something that would be nationally recognized, and then infusing the haiku with that vertical access, and yet then maybe doing something more personal, more local, uh, and making that the horizontal access. Okay, so that's it for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Patricia, for having me. Please let me know uh, what you thought, if there are any questions. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, follow friend Patricia on her various Poetry P podcast. That's hard to say three times fast. <laughs> uh, and to buy her lots of coffee to uh, fuel an intern. Also, if you are in the buying mood, please consider donating to Otoroshi Journal so we can keep the journal going and pay for our contributors. How do people donate to that journal? There's How a donation link on the website. Okay. And it'll go right to us. And also, not only donate, but come along, read your submission guidelines and get involved. Oh, and submit. Yeah, we're open for submissions uh, the month of July. And then August. we probably will be having a contest again in October as well. Okay. July and October. So the people have missed a July by the time this goes up, but mm -hmm. get ready for October. We've just done a podcast on speculative haiku. Yep. And people yep. wanted to know where they could write more and send more. Right. And you would be a recipient for just those Absolutely. sort of, of haiku. So go and have a look because Josh is your man. But anyway, getting back to, um, to your presentation, thank you so much for that. It's something I really try hard to do to try and add a little bit of depth to my, to my work. It doesn't always work. And I sort of had some questions for you. At the end, you possibly went some way to answering one of my questions, was, which was, we work in a global haiku community here. And I find it really difficult to find, for example, a literary illusion that's going to resonate across the board. Am I trying too hard or should I just go with something that I know very well? How, how, would you, how do you get around that problem, the sort of global yeah, nature? Yeah, I think that's, of our, that's, uh, that's a balance. Okay. That's the only way I can I can say it. I, I think there's no way that we're going to write a poem that's going to connect to everybody. And then I also think like, you know, we can write a poem and, on, and in a hundred years, we're going to lose all the contemporary understanding of that poem. And I keep thinking about some of the things that Shirani wrote about Basho and and some of Basho's haiku. If you look at what we have to understand about Basho's work, about Basho's life, about the, just the general mentality of that world or that lifestyle, it's very difficult to understand uh, where that vertical axis comes in unless you've studied it. A lot of the poems seem to work as these very brief, fleeting uh, immediate poems and it without the help of scholars like Shirane, like Uida, uh and and others those are the two that I know have done a lot on Basho but there are certainly others uh, but without their kind of their scholarship their guidance and their their understanding of the world we're not going to understand exactly what haiku what 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 the the hoku or the haiku what meant or what basho was going for in the link or whatever um so i would say as long as you feel that it's culturally relevant i i think that's the guideline if if it's something that you feel most people would know or understand maybe not everybody and maybe not everybody on a global scale certainly but if uh, again if it's some book that that clearly is famous enough to win an, a nationally recognized award or if it's part of like you know the western literary canon 
you know, Dante's Inferno or Shakespeare or, or, or any of the, you know, Beowulf, if we want to go back, you know, uh, you know, Sappho and, 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 and Aeschylus and, and, you know, Sophocles and any, any of these classic literatures, um, I think that would be fine. And, and of course, I would urge uh, people to look at the literatures of their country. I'm not that familiar with uh, Indian national epics, but I know they exist. So I would encourage those poems. Uh, the other thing is, I think we we uh, live in, in a very luxurious time in that we can Google things and find out what we may not understand. So if there's a reference to a particular piece of art or literature that I don't get, I can Google it. And then the third thing I would say is that the poem still has to stand on its own, even without Googling all the all the history, the detail, the understanding, most of Basho's poems still work, but so do some other poets uh, immediately. And so we really, it, the, the poem needs to work as a poem. Um, and then if we add depth with that vertical illusion, that's great. But I, I still think the poem needs to work uh, as a poem. But I do think that it is possible. And I've seen examples that I think are, are very well done of, of poems that have tapped into vertical illusion. Can you think of any off the top of your head? Uh, these are a couple of, that I found uh, on uh, Dave Bonta's blog, We Are Negativa. Whose woods these are? A barred owl asks nothing of me. Sunset and evening star, the smell of pine comes from a bottle. And again, those were published privately on a blog, but I, I think they, they definitely tap into, I think they're both uh, effective, and I think they both tap into some of the, the literary illusions that uh, we can think about. There is one, and I was trying to find it uh, on the Heron's Nest, I remember about a thrush uh, cracking snails uh, in November. That's a clear allusion to The Hobbit. Um, and it's just beautifully done. So again, taking those iconic scenes, taking those iconic uh, works of literature, you know, Frost or, or Tolkien or whoever. And, and, and I really want to, I mean, as, as much as, you know, we can tap into the classical literature or the classical canon, uh, I would certainly encourage folks to, to go beyond that and look at various other canons uh, of literature that maybe aren't as explored. If people don't understand the vertical axis, like I said, they can go look it up or they can talk about it or the author can present that at part of the the reading or whatever and and that would be effective too so i i really think there's a lot here that people can tap into and of course the the idea is is to not make it as forced as uh or as obvious perhaps but to do it in in ways that are soft and subtle and 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 still encapsulate the the haiku aesthetics that that we've come to know and love yeah I, in some ways it's i suppose what we're asking is a little bit like the speculative poetry um in that i love the way you put it what was it Do, doodle on the add some doodles to the sistine chapel um have the have notre dame bells playing acdc at midnight that that sort of sort of thing yeah that'd be awesome but do it in a haiku <laughs> but I think that's possible. I, I, I think it might, and it might get a little silly. It might get a little Gendai. It might get a little out there, but I, you know, I, I would much rather see those fun experiments. I think, I, I think the other thing uh, that, that might be an issue is that a lot of the Kigo that we have inherited from Japan don't make sense in the West or don't have that depth in the West. So we can write cherry blossom haiku, but we don't have like hundreds of generations of people, you know, of, of that cultural understanding about cherry blossoms and what that means and why we do, why we do cherry blossom viewings or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
and and how that's related to the whole agricultural sustenance of the country and and whatnot. So it, it's interesting that a lot of the the agricultural or agrarian imagery that has been imbued in Japanese culture has come through in literature, and that um, a, a lot of that I think is lost in you know twentieth twenty first century haiku. We can go through I, any religious text and find seasonal references, plants, animals, what have you. These would be cultural texts, you know. And if if we think about Basho tapping into Shinto or 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 Zen ideals, well, he clearly would have known the religious texts, mm -hmm. some of them, of of those of those religions. He would be familiar with them. Remember, the schools were in the temples and the shrines. Mm -hmm. So they would have been reading religious texts as part of their everyday curriculum or writing or transcribing or whatever. Um, yeah, these are these are iconic texts. So why not use the Western uh, literary text, Western religious text, or like I said, I know you've got international uh, following that's huge. Use the international religious text. What what um, are like I said are coming out of, of India, which I know as a huge yeah. haiku community. Tap into those religious texts or tap into you, you know like Midnight's Children um, or or something like that. You know that that idea and those iconic images that were associated with that movement, uh, which of course stems from a novel and everything. No. Yeah, absolutely. Those those socio political movements and how iconic those were. So yeah, the, these these ideas uh, permeate culture, and I, and I definitely think that that regionality has something to play. But I also think. Um, anybody who is interested in writing and literature knows probably at least some or has a vague familiarity with some of the key or core texts in any of the various canons and could tap into that. And I think it would be awesome. I think you made a very important point because, again, the editing team here are quite global, too. So we're not going to understand necessarily every... Um, oh, sure. Everything on the vertical axis. Contemporary, we should be okay. There's horizontal, yep. some contemporary stuff's fine. And as you brightly pointed out, Google is there to be used if yeah, we're not getting it. I think as long as the poem stands or the haiku or senryu stands as a well crafted piece of work, exactly. it will get a second glance. It will, it will get looked at properly. And then if we need to, we can do the, re do the research to, to get the depth. But um, the important thing is to is to get a nice piece of work written absolutely yeah go back go go as yeah. far back to these iconic things as you can um and and really you know find find the image find the moment and what's interesting is that basho is he's very clearly alluding to previous poems Battles that were famous, like these are things that that uh, a lot of people would have known about. But yeah. like you said, Westerners, yeah, we can do a little research and whatnot, but the poem still works. Yeah. So I really think that like if somebody makes some subtle allusion to a very, you know, obscure Shakespeare quote, you know, or, or they pick some play that nobody likes or whatever that still can work as long as the poem is effective. Uh, but again, cultural memory, uh, using iconic images related to the culture, uh, consider symbolism, like symbols that represent the culture, uh, cultural associations, uh, writing haiku that allude to popular culture. Even thinking back on Basho, like a lot of his poetry collaborations a lot of those were done on pilgrimages. And I think the idea of a pilgrimage as a religious experience may put some people off. But what if you what if we wrote, you know, haiku on pilgrimages to popular spots like 
you, you know, like a, a, a very famous landmark, like the Grand Canyon or Stonehenge or whatever. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm off that, to see the Statue of Liberty soon again. That's so. of Liberty, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like what, that, that sort of pilgrimage would like lead into a really cool high boon and then maybe some extra haiku. But like that's it, like the Statue of Liberty is an iconic piece of art. It's an iconic building, a ki- an iconic tourist um destination so it's it while every person in the world and every person who reads haiku may not know about the statue of liberty they may have some picture of it or some image of it in their mind and and be able to to connect with that and then of course cultural conflicts social conflicts social justice conflicts mm. And then, like I said, Basho was writing about a historical conflict. It was an actual battle that that mm-hmm. people would have been familiar about. So this yeah. is again, uh, all all these things would have been uh, familiar with with his audience. Um, and so, find the ones I, I would urge your readers and submitters to find the the things that they think your audience or their audience would connect with within these categories, and really try and use them as jumping off points for haiku. And before we end, just one last thing. How do we write something that's going to last or should we not bother worrying about no, how, how I, long I, I honestly, once you try to, to write something that is uh, famous, beautiful, you know, whatever, then I, I think you're going to lose it. I, yeah. I think it's, it's, the, it's the idea that you write the poems the write the poems that come to you write the you know read a book or or read uh you know look at art think about cultural symbolism and write the poems that mean something to you and then hopefully they will connect with the reader but anytime you try and write something that's going to be famous or or going to be lasting i think you're you're doomed to fail yeah uh, cuz you're going to be thinking about that instead of going with the the organic the natural the spontaneous the yeah. the immediate gut reactions inspiration what have you and um you know may, maybe think about it when editing but yeah I, I certainly not when composing don't think how can i make this more deep or more famous mm-hmm. trust in your skills trust in yourself trust that the illusions you you are choosing if they're famous to you they're certainly going to be famous to other people Mm -hmm. and uh go from there and the other thing to say is i'm currently reading cider with rosie by laurie lee i picked it up and i'm really not getting very far because i'm i read a couple of pages and then i have to stop and because it's just inspiring me to write it's bringing Mm -hmm. things out and i think when you start looking at pieces of art uh reading wonderful pieces of literature thinking about cultural conflicts you know just thinking about these issues they will inspire you to write and hopefully some of those will be bang on for this topic but if they're not you're going to have some wonderful work coming out of this workshop just because it encourages you to to look at other areas that you perhaps haven't trolled through before i mean the bible i hadn't thought about really going back and looking at things coming through symbolism stories coming through the bible and why why hadn't i thought of that i do not know but you know when i finished sided with rosie i'm gonna go back and there you go and have a look at that too so i thank you very much josh for doing this presentation for us today for really making me think about where I can go and look and how I can add depth and you know use the two axes in my poetry and it's it's just been great thank you very much indeed very welcome I hope you'll be inspired by this episode of the podcast Joshua really got my creative juices flowing and I thought I'd share a couple of my initial efforts with you just to give you a flavor of what I'm expecting But first, let me start with a haiku Joshua couldn't put his hands on for the podcast, but has since shared with me. First frost. The thrush brings a snail to the anvil stone. First frost. The thrush brings a snail to the anvil stone. Sarah Wintridge, 
Heron's Nest, Volume 6, Number 9, from October 2004. And here, if you're an aficionado of Tolkien's work, you will know that Sarah is alluding to The Hobbit. And now for a couple from me. The first one, Mad Dogs and Englishmen Chasing Downhill Cheese. Mad Dogs and Englishmen Chasing Downhill Cheese. And I'm delighted to say that Joshua workshopped this one with me after the podcast. It's an allusion to an old coward song, Mad Dogs and Englishmen Go Out in the Midday Sun. So I'm hoping that Kigo is implied there. And of course, this is combined with a cultural, contemporary, historical event. Yes, the English really do chase cheeses downhill. You can see this in an episode of We Are the Champions on Netflix. And I'm sure you can find it on YouTube too. It's really not something for the faint hearted. I certainly wouldn't fancy doing it. And finally, Stuck in traffic on the New Jersey Turnpike, counting cars. Stuck in traffic on the New Jersey Turnpike, counting cars. Again, I'm using illusion in this one and combining it with a moment I've recently experienced. Quite possibly a cultural event for the good people of New Jersey. Certainly one member of my family. The illusion is to Simon and Garfunkel's America. And I'll put a link in the show notes, of course. I'm hoping you're as excited as me about this topic and your haiku notebook is swamped with ideas for new, deep and meaningful haiku. I look forward to reading them in September. And remember, reading periods run 1st to 15th of every month. And right now, we're reading your work using contrast in your juxtaposition. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please listen to podcast S5E13. It's available wherever you get your podcasts, on the Poetry P YouTube channel and, of course, the Poetry P website. So get your haiku and senryu rolling in because the clock is ticking. And don't forget your chance to be featured on the podcast and the journal by adding your haiku and senryu to the comments section of the video prompt on our YouTube channel. So I'll see you next time for a reading of your vulgar haiku and senryu. Until then, keep writing. Everything you need should be in the show notes. But if not, you know where to send your email. And let me know something's missing. Ciao.